Hi everybody, welcome to Sunday service here at VOG Retreat. Can you all stand, please? Can we all stand? I see that everybody's excited, chit-chatting and stuff. Let's take this time to just close our eyes and take a deep breath and invite the Holy Spirit, Ruach, the breath of life, to quiet our heart, to quiet our mind, uh, and be able to focus on God. We are here for God, God Almighty, the Alpha and Omega, the creator of the universe. He's the same God, the same God in the Bible. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We can come before an almighty, awesome God. That we are here to serve you, to praise you, God. Let our words of praise be welcoming to your ears. God, I ask you quiet our minds, calm our hearts to be able to focus upon you. Because we are here for you, God. God, let your will be done. Let us not be... Let us be unashamed to worship you. We are in a safe space. This is our family, our church. And we just want to worship you together as a unity. Because we are all brothers and sisters. We are all called child of God. Thank you, God, for your love. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
great is our God. We are here at retreat seeking after him. We are experiencing his love all around us through the people we meet. God, you've shown us love. We love because you first loved us. Oh, how great. You have saved us, God. You have sent your son who has died and resurrected and saved us. So just take this moment. Our God. 
are awesome when we are here because we want to praise you, God. You have loved us so much and we want to be here in your presence. God, you called us child. You called us your children. And you know our hearts. You know where we've been. And I pray that your love helps us to be here today, to focus upon you, God. I pray for your Holy Spirit to speak through our pastor. And let us hear the goodness. Let us taste and see your word and your love. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
show that to her. So when she's married, when she's dating later on, she can identify a guy who's not going to be part of her life. Yeah, granted, she'll probably marry around 45 or so because I won't let her. <laughs> right? Uh, but, but I want her to identify uh, when she sees a good guy because uh, there are a lot of bad guys out there too. And that, that's pertinent to here, what I want to share today. I want to read from Isaiah. It says, But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the dead, and you are our, we are the clay, and you are our pot. We are all the to understand who we are, because right now there's so many messages coming into our homes from outside our homes and outside the scripture. There's so many bad news about who we are and what we are. Uh, um, yesterday, oh, it's not working. Yeah. Oh, you're recording me? All right, minus all the stuff I said so far. <laughs> I didn't realize I was going to record it. Hey, let me change my message. No. Um, where was I? Yeah, there's so much messages out there. Yesterday I got, you know, some of you guys are eating s'mores. How was it? Good, right? Yeah. 20 years ago, I would have gotten there and ate some too. But M&M's was enough. Thank you very much. Um, I got home. I got up and I was looking at some news. And then a 27-year-old Korean actress just, you know, killed herself. And I was reading that story, and I'm reminded of last month of all these dying of young people. Some are suicidal, some accidents. And, um, and I thought, man, why is this happening? And, and one of the things that comes to my mind is that somehow we've been manipulated into thinking that we're not that important, we're not that valuable. And I want to remind us how God sees us and how you are to see yourself, both man and woman. How much do you think you're worth? Just guess. How much do you think you're worth in, term, in terms of monetary USD? Right? How much do you think you're worth? Huh? Huh? Not very much. Alright, how much do you think it's worth? Chemicals. Less than a dollar. Oh, that really builds us up, right? Whew, less than a dollar. That's, that's less than a gallon of gas. Uh, but he's correct. I mean, these are the makeup of our bodies, the chemical compounds within our bodies, right? Oxygen. I mean, we're full of air, right? 65% is oxygen, you know? We're a bunch of airheads, right? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and, and, and so on. And he's correct. If we were to add all these up, I mean, there's additional stuff like silicone and and fluorine and, and all these things. But if you add it up, it's about a dollar or less than a dollar, uh, which is kind of sad to think about, but that's the reality of our chemical makeup, right? And actually, when I was looking at this, it, it made me think about what Lisa said. If these are what we are, then how we eat matters, right? Because these things need to remain healthy. The most valuable part about our body is actually our skin. Right? Imperial um, State Institute for Nutrition at Tokyo, they actually developed a way to measure a human, I guess, skin uh, volume, I suppose. So they had an average guy come over naked. They covered him with, you know, basically paper machete. Not machete, mache. And then uh, he dried it up and cut it up, and they measured it. And at the time, right, they were using cowhide as a measurement of cost. It was 25 cents at the time. Per square foot. And then if you average it out for an uh, average person, it comes down to about $3.50. So you're worth about $4.50. How do you feel? Feel great, right? With inflation, maybe $10? You can't even go watch a movie, right? That's one way to measure how, how valuable you are. I think another way to measure is go to the black market because you're worth a lot more right? I mean, think about it. Your bone marrow will fetch about $23 million. And that's not bad, right? $23 million. No wonder there are countries where they harvest your organs. That's a lot of money. Your DNA is actually worth $9.7 million. That's not bad. Making you feel better? Right? That's better than four thirty, dollars right? Or four fifty. Your organs, right? Like your lung is about $120,000. 
Anybody want to give up one? All right, 120,000. You might be able to buy a house in Fresno. Who knows? Like, you know, put a down payment, right? Um, your heart, actually, this was kind of surprising. It's about $60,000. So if you just add up all the organs and stuff, it comes out to about $45 million. That's not bad. Except if you try to use it, you can't because you're dead, <laughs> right? I mean, but that's, that's better than $4.50, obviously, right? So much of what something is worth is not so much dependent on my makeup, but a lot of it is dependent upon who made me. I remember telling you a story about my son, Ethan. He loves drawing. He still draws. And he came up, and I was sleeping. He came up, Dad, Dad, and he showed me a picture, right? It's like, what is that? And I'm looking at it, I'm like, it looks like a dinosaur. It looks like a shark. And at the time, he was into dinosaurs and shark. And I was thinking, I'm like, 50 50, what is it? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, shark, good job. He goes, no, Dad, dinosaur, dinosaur, right? That paper lost value that day, <laughs> right? Because I can't use it for anything else. But to me, that paper is precious, more valuable than anything else because my kid's drawing is on there, right? I can scribble something on the paper, on a paper, and it probably devalue the paper. But if it was Picasso, right, every single one of us will want it because it'll be priceless because of the person who scribbled on that paper. This, th th this, this painting is one of my favorite paintings from Rembrandt. And it's called the prodigal son. I've never seen the real one, right? Um, but it's just an amazing, very moody, very storytelling picture. How much do you think this is worth? The original painting. Huh? You can't buy it. They won't sell it to you. This is priceless, right? But if you went to a museum that had this, and go to the shop and get a postcard, guess how much it is? Probably around 5 to $10 max, right? A copy is never as expensive as the original. The original is always more expensive than a copy. Just remember that. Right? Just remember that. And so often, people are born original, and then they live their life like what? Trying to be a copy of somebody else. And I think God doesn't want us to be that. Psalm 19, some of you are familiar with this. It says, you have formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Do you know that very well? There, you're more than what Hollywood says you are. You're more than the posters that you see. You're more than the K-pop people. You know, I visited Korea once, and I thought, man, how can women be so skinny? It's like they don't have organs. If the wind blows, they'll blow with it. That's how skinny they were. I was like, well, this is amazing. I mean, it's like they don't even eat. And yet, that's the image that they have projected into themselves and said, I'm beautiful because I'm like this. And, and because of the society that we live in, we tend to equate beauty with how we look outside. And it's tragic because a person who is so beautiful, like this girl who died in Korea, doesn't think she's beautiful enough for the society she's living in. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship. Other version says his masterpiece. The original word is poigma, which is poetry. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we will walk in them. Did you hear that? You are God's what? You are God's Rembrandt. Masterpiece, workmanship, poetry. What is poetry? Anybody here write poem? Is it easy? It just comes to you, right? Roses are red, right? you know, whatever, right? Poetry is hard because you're trying to express what's in your heart with a single word that can say things. So you take hours and hours trying to figure out that one word that expresses your feelings. And that's what God says he's doing with us. That you are expression of his love in this world. Turn to the person next to you, especially if you're with your uh, wife or someone you love. You are God's masterpiece. Tell them. All right? You're God's masterpiece. 
right? You're God's masterpiece. And it's sometimes good to know that, right? Yeah. You're God's masterpiece. Anybody having a hard time saying that to the person next to you? You are, whoa, <laughs> right? <laughs> that would be bad, my friend. You are God's workmanship. So let me share with you why God created us. One, you are object of God's love. We're affected by so many things around us. But you're an object of God's love. God did not create us to enslave us. Right? His command for us in Genesis was not, okay, right, work in this garden until you pass out. Some of us live our lives like that. You're working way too much, right? Because we're trying to make ends meet. And, you know, there are times where we need to do that. But we, have, we ought to remember that's not us. You're more than your work. Your work is not you. Work is an expression of who you are, but your work is not you. We live in a country where we equate our identity with what we do, right? And, and I think it's probably more prevalent in Asian community than any other community because, you know, our parents have narrowed down our job to five areas, right? Lawyer, business, engineer, and so forth. But there's so much out there, so much more than what we have narrowed down to, these five categories that makes us, you know, at least live a decent living in this country. But there's so many. I, I look at our children here, and some of them are so creative, probably. I don't know them well enough to say it, but I bet you they're more creative than most of us. But our education system will kill that creativity at some point because we made it into math, language, and history. Now, that's very important, by the way. You should know math, lang and language, and history. But our kids are so creative, and they will draw things and do things. And because us as parents are thinking, well, can they make a living out of that? We'll douse that creativity at some point. I hope you don't do that, right? Our kids are so intelligent, and sometimes we, we don't say it that way. I don't know why. Uh, I'm not sure if that's Asian culture or every culture does this. We think uh, um, negativity creates positive action, right? Which is kind of weird, right? Like, it's like, you're so fat, and you're, you're thinking, well, that means because I'm saying he's so fat, he's going to lose weight. It's just a weird thinking, right? And like I told you, my, my mom used to say that to me, right? She's like, hey, lose weight. You're getting too big. And then you turn around, and she says, did you eat? Did you eat? You know, because <laughs> Asian moms, that's their way of saying I love you, Right? Like, mom, I'm getting confused. Either tell me to lose weight or don't tell me to eat, right? And oh, she's always cooking for me, right? And I'm like, no, don't use negative to bring out positive. Use positive to bring out positive, right? Why would you do that? But we have this weird sense of trying to change people with negativity. And, and this is what uh, uh, Hargreaves says about our commercials and media. And this is a while back ago, and I think it's still true today. She says, girls who viewed commercials depicting women who modeled unrealistically thin, ideal type of beauty caused girls to feel less confident, more angry, more dissatisfied with their weight and appearance. And that's true. That's true for guys, too. I mean, I got to tell you, this church, from all the churches I've been to, you guys are a really healthy group of people. All right? I mean, some of you are really buff. All right? You got muscles where I don't even know I have muscles, right? Uh, you know, basically, well, most of you are very, very healthy, looking as well, right? Um, but, but health is more than that. If you listen to Lisa's uh, uh, sharing yesterday, obviously health is more than how I look, right? And, uh, and, and I tell you, in the last uh, two, three months where I read the newspaper and see the people who committed suicide or died in some way, um, sort of say, these are all skinny people, actually, right? And because they're all famous, they're all famous. And, and they're not big people, they're skinny people. Health is more than how I look. Health is something that happens within us. Uh, Dove, uh, you, so I don't know if you're using Dove soap, but they did a little experiment many years ago. There are about three experiments that, uh, that are out there. One of them is where a woman comes in and tries to explain to a person how she looks. And an artist over here is drawing her description of herself. And, and what they discover is that a woman will always describe her worse than who she really is. And she's surprised. Well, she's not surprised when the artist shows the picture because she says, oh, yeah, that's how I feel, right? But she's so much more beautiful 
as a you know a, 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 a person who's watching this commercial than how she depicts herself. And then they did one for men. Men have reverse issue, all right? They always think they're Brad Pitt, all right? Like square chin, you know? And then they show the picture of who they really are, like how other people have described them. They get so mad. What? One guy actually said this, right? He says, you're a bad artist, and he left, all right? Men actually have this weird thing where they think they're better looking or better than they are. And it's true. It's our psychology, right? A beautiful woman with hourglass figure will look at the mirror and one thing they see is what? Like one fat right here somewhere, right? A guy like me who isn't bigger than me looks at the mirror. Guess what I see? One muscle <laughs> right here. And you flex, you know? Uh, I used to go to gym and um, you never see girls going right? But you always see guys going, <laughs> you know? Uh, and it's our psychology. It's our psychology. Um, Dove did another experiment when they, where they had two doors, and one of them said beautiful, and the other one said, I think it's like uh, normal or something like that. And then it filmed people, the women who were going through these doors and their reactions. And let me show you to what, what's happening, right? I have it up here. It was my choice and now I will question myself for the next few weeks, maybe months. We had an option of two pathways to walk and they led to two doorways. It was a bit confronting actually, to be honest to see these big signs and feeling like you had to choose and be self-conscious of how you perceive yourself and perhaps if it lines up with how the rest of the world perceives you. I went through the average door. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't even hesitate. <laughs> Mas eu acho que é mais porque eu me arrependi da escolha porque era diferente do que eu vivo, é diferente do que eu do que eu sou. Am I choosing because of what's constantly bombarded at me, what I'm being told that I should accept, or am I choosing because that's what I really believe? I walked into that door with said average, and I didn't feel really good after that because obviously I had rated myself average and nobody else. Todos os dias eu passo pela porta comum e ontem foi um dia único e eu optei por passar pelo bonita. I wanted to go through the average door, but my mum just pulled me over to the bicycle <laughs> door. It was quite a triumphant feeling. It was like telling the world, I think I'm beautiful. I just wish more young women realized it. I think I would walk through the beautiful door. Yeah, it's quite a triumphant feeling. 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 It's somebody really beautiful looking back at me. Beautiful is a great word. So why not see what's on the other side of that?
Isn't that interesting? I bet you every single man here have no problem walking under beautiful. <laughs> and you lie to yourself, right? But if you look at these ladies, obviously it's, they're not thinking about their outer appearance, I think. They're all beautiful ladies. Somewhere along the line, their psychology has changed. And they can't see beauty. But do you see how some of them were able to walk into that beautiful door? How did they do it? Somebody else brought them there. And don't you think that's why you're here, to remind each other how beautiful you are? Because God has created you. And we need to do more of that, right? More of that. Because God did not create us to feel bad about who we are. My friends, I don't know if you believe in evolution in terms of, you know, monkeys becoming human beings. Um, I may be wrong politically, but I'm going to let you know you're not a monkey. God created you from the very beginning, thinking about you. You did not evolve from a, some primordial ooze by accident. No, God created you from the very beginning to be the person that you are. Of course, there, within the species, there can be some evolution, but not this jump, right? Do you think the reason there's so much violence and murder is because we no longer value the human life? That we would kill somebody for five bucks because elementally we're only four dollars and fifty cents? War is way off the course. Don't follow the world. Look at scripture. And parents, you gotta remind your kids that they're more than what the school teaches them. They're more than the A's and the B's. I can't say C because they die, right? So A's and the B's that they get from school. They're more than that. They're more than the major that they get. Don't worry about it. If they have their life straight with God, God will take care of them, not you. You know, one day I just realized that I cannot be with my kids 24-7. It's impossible, but God can. So I can only give them to Him. Maybe for some of you, this was a hard video to look at because it's reminding of how you view yourself. And God's coming today and says, no, that's not you. I made you beautiful, wonderful, and fearfully so that you can live your life with that kind of confidence in this world. Don't let guys define you, ladies, right? And don't let girls define you, guys. And don't let Arnold Schwarzenegger define your body either, right? No, you're defined by God. And allow that truth to seep into you. You are God's workmanship created in the image of God. That one day, as believers, he will come and gather us into his kingdom. And there we will live in glory forever. Don't forget that. Yes, life gets tough sometimes. Yes, the paycheck needs to come in so I can pay the bill at the end of the month. But that's not who you are, right? The person that you are is defined by God, and remember that. Secondly, is that he wants you to know that you are an object of his love. Don't just read the Bible and go, oh, yeah, that's how God views me and ignore it. No, that's how you should view yourself, right? You should view yourself. I don't know if any of you ever collect anything. I used to collect comic books, baseball cards, basketball cards. My mom threw a lot of those away. That's why I'm poor, all right? <laughs> if she had kept it, I could have made some money out of that stuff. I actually at one point had about 3,000 comic books. And then... My friend was doing some nonprofit, so I just kind of donated it all to him, right? And I kept a few of them. I kept them because of the artists. I really love these artists. And the reason I looked up one of them, wow, I bought it for 75 cents. I think it's almost $1,000 now. Or I'm like, hey, you can't touch it anymore, right? Because <laughs> it's going up. Now I need to send it off to a company that will grade it and put like a hard case on it so it won't, it won't bend or anything, right? So I hope I get about 9.2 or 9.5. That's pretty high. And then it'll go up in value uh, into that. What do you think is the most expensive comic books out there? Let me show you the top five, right? Superman number one, $507,000. You could buy a house, right, with that. So one comic book, that's a lot. What's amazing is that there is somebody who's willing to pay that much money for 23 pages of fading ink, right? Next one, number two, uh, so the fourth most expensive one is Batman. $567,000, right? It might have gone up because this was many years ago that I put this together, right? Third one. There you go. Right? All-Star Comics, $936,000. That's not too bad. Anybody have one of these? Anybody wish you had one? All right? 
Here's the second most expensive comic out there. $2.1 million is Detective Comic Books. Starting, this is the first appearance of Batman, I believe. Right? So Batman, I mean, he's getting his prize worth, right? But number one, guess which one it is? Here we go. $3.2 million. The first appearance of Superman, right? And there's only a few copies right now. I think there's like maybe four or five copies at max. And this is worth $3.2 million. Anybody want to buy this one? Right? That's to be lifetime of down payment and payment for the rest of your life. But, 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 but people are willing to pay this. This ink and paper is not worth that much. But the person that's buying it is putting that value on this particular comic book and saying it's $3.2 million. One way to determine the value of your life is how much is somebody willing to pay for you. In Ephesians chapter 2, 10, the first section that we read, the key word there is in Christ Jesus. It's when you are in Christ Jesus that you finally realize the worth of your life. You don't know who you are until you find Christ, my friends, right? That God who loves us will send His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you, that's your value. There's, there's a price tag in everything that we see in this world, right? I don't know what your favorite uh, place to shop is. Let's go to Costco. We are talking about Costco this morning. Somebody, oh, I think it was you, right? And Costco is not shopping, right? Costco is adventure. Before COVID, you go through it, you come out full, <laughs> right? Because you try all these different things in adventure. You know, you go there, you spend a long time in there. Every single item in that store has a price tag, right? And we go to Costco because we think we're saving what? Money. But because we buy in bulk, we throw away a lot of it because we can't finish it on time, right? So we actually lose money unless you have a big family or you're wise about how you cook your food, right? How much do you think you're worth? You have a price tag. There's a price tag around you. That's right. That's right. There's a price tag, and it's not a number. It's a name. It's Jesus Christ. Just think about that. The creator of the universe, almighty God, gave up his life for you. Just meditate on that for the rest of your life, and you'll feel okay. Right? But here's the deal. Mom and dad's in this room. You're willing to die for your kids. Amen? Amen, right? Every woman will say it very quickly. Men usually take a little longer, but this is a good group. I heard men say amen really quickly too. <laughs> right? So that, that's, that's, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. I, I, I recently saw um, uh, uh, this comedian guy, and I totally agree. He said, when I had my son in my heart, I said I could die for this kid. And I'm like, hey, that's how I felt when Nathan was born. I could die for this kid, right? And then when my daughter was born, I was thinking I could kill for this kid, right? It's a totally different kind of mindset. It's like you become an instant murderer, right? <laughs> because, because that's how we feel about our kids. There's a Korean saying, when your spouse dies, you bury him in the ground. But when your child dies, where do you bury him or her? In your heart. What that says is this. Our children's life is more valuable than what? My life. And when God the Father gave up His Son to die for us, He gave something that was even more precious than His own life. That's who you are. Don't let people mistreat you. Christianity doesn't mean you become a doormat, right? It means you live in confidence as the person that God has created you. You know, the world uses this against Christians, right? Well, you know, it says if somebody smacks you on the left side, you should turn to the other side, right? Right? Is that, is that what Jesus is saying? When somebody punches you, you let them punch you some more? I hope that's not how you understand the Sermon on the Mount, right? Because when you read that section, and I might have shown this to you already, but for those of you who have not, um, I need a volunteer. Can I get a volunteer? All right. All right, come on up. This is the fastest hand going up in an Asian church. All right, usually I have to wait a few times, huh? Oh, he volunteered you. Yeah, yeah. You didn't want to volunteer. Uh, 
So in the Bible, there are three sections that come right away, right? One of them is if somebody smacks you, right? So I'm going to demonstrate this. <laughs> right? You turn your cheek the other way, right? So think about the society that Christians are living at the time. Those who were authority were people in the Roman culture. The soldiers were high up in authority. When you think you're better than somebody, how do you smack somebody? Like this, right? You backhand that person. So, so move your head, right? And Jesus says, turn your head the other way. And the only way I can smack him is how? With my palm. You know what this action says? No, no, I'm equal to you. It's a silent protest against the authority that was there at the time. It's not like, oh, you smacked me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Smack me some more time. You need help. Right? We're not supposed to be doormat. You're supposed to stand firm in your faith and stand for what is right. Not just allow people to walk all over you. This is why you need to learn and grow and expand. So you don't get smashed by people as Christians. The second one says this. If, no, I need you, I need you. I need, I, I need you for a long time. I'm not paying you, but I need you, okay? The second one says this. If somebody asks you to carry something for a mile, what did Jesus say? Carry for two miles. So think about it. Who's the person who's in authority in this culture at the first century? A Roman soldier. So I go to a Jew, and I say, hey, carry this barrel for me. There's a law in the Roman uh, government at the time, you cannot make somebody carry something more than a mile. You can carry something for a mile, right? So he's a very nice Jew, so he carries the barrel. Can we, can we see it? There you go. Oh, strong guy. That was a thousand pound barrel right there. And he carries for a, a mile with me, right? He's going, he's going. <laughs> I need to take you home, right? <laughs> right? And then after a mile, I'm saying, oh, you can drop it and I'm going to find somebody else. But instead of dropping, he goes, no, 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 I'll carry for another mile. I'm going, no, 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 drop it because I'm going to get somebody else. And he goes, no, 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 I'm a nice guy. I'm going to carry for another mile. Now my, I'm thinking, well, if, he got, if I make him care for another mile, what happens to me? I get in trouble. And I'm thinking, does he have some people over there who's about to kill me? Why would he do that? No one would do that, right? Why would you want to carry this for two miles? Now I'm thinking, oh, shoot, something's happening. Please, can you? <laughs> the authority, the way I communicate with the person changes now because I'm begging him to drop that. You're resisting authority that is not rightly placed. Right? So you're resisting that. It's peaceful resistance, actually. You remember what the third one is? If somebody, if you have a cloak, Right, somebody's asking for it, right? What happens? Give them all, right? You can go inside now. I don't, I, 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 we, don't, we, we don't need to see you naked here. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> right? Goes to the court. And God says, give it all up. Right? Just think about it. In the Jewish culture, it's not wrong to be naked. It's wrong to what? Look at nakedness. So this man is in the court, and the, and the authority says, hey, you got to give it back, right? Because, you know, whatever. And the soldier is higher, more authority than you. And Jesus says, just give him all. And you're walking out there, what? Naked. And everyone's going, oh, I can't look at it. Authority change. You resist the world, not like the way the world fights you, but you resist, resist the world the way Jesus has called us to resist through peace. God has never called us to be a doormat. But a lot of times, because people misunderstand what Scripture is saying, they act like doormats. And please don't. You look at the Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, you have people who are proud to be followers of Jesus Christ, and not allowing authority to step all over them if they can help it. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. And you're worth at least... Jesus is life. Get that into your system, please. And don't let the world step all over you. Lastly, God wants you to live that way. Right? You got to see yourself more than you think you are. 
You got to see yourself as God sees you. And then live that way. Do you remember that children's story, The Ugly Duckling? Do you remember that story? Right? He, a, a, a little duckling looking thing is hanging out with ugly, I mean, other ducks, and the people are calling, I mean, the other ducks are call, calling it ugly. You don't quack like a duck, you don't walk like a quack, uh, duck, you don't swim like a duck, and they're making fun of him, right? Hey, what an ugly duck. And then one day, someone comes along and says, you're not a duck, you're a swan. If you remember, at least the one, the children's book that I read, the last page has this swan flying with the sun behind it in his majestic way. Maybe some of you are swans and you think you're a duck, walking around like a duck, quacking like a duck, but maybe you should be flying instead. See, in Christ, everything makes the difference in Christ because we get to see the reality of who we are before God. We're not evolutionary accident. We're not what we wear. It's one of the worst things we can do to ourselves, flaunting who we are by what we wear, what we drive, the kind of house we live in. We need that, by the way. You know, you know what, I mean, one day I was thinking, you know, a lot of immigrants come over to this, this country and they want to, you know, fulfill their American dream. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. But one day I was thinking that, you know, a couple comes over, they have a couple of kids and they're, they're living in an apartment like we did when we first came over. We live in an apartment with one bedroom and all eight, ten of us were living there, right? So eight of us are in the living room, like sleeping wherever we can. Mom and dad were in their room. But people come like that. I don't know about now, but in the past they did. And they're thinking, man, we need a house because my friend just bought a house. So mom and dad work really, really hard and, and um, you know, they don't eat the things they want to eat. They don't wear the clothes they want to wear and they save up a lot. And one day they finally buy the house with two bedrooms and a bathroom. Now the oldest can live in the, another room and the rest of us still sleep in the bathroom. I mean, in the living room, right? And then they're living, they're happy until they see their friend bought another house. Oh, they have two bathrooms with three bedrooms, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, we have 10 people trying to use one bathroom, another bathroom would be so nice. So you work really hard, right? You, get, you work really hard, not wear the things you want to wear, not go to place you want to go. You work really hard, save up, and then you buy a house with two bathrooms and one more bedroom. And now you feel so good until another friend buy a bigger house. And you're like, oh my goodness, three bathrooms will be amazing. That's heaven on earth. And you work really, really hard. And then you get old and you die. What was the purpose of your life? Increased bathroom in my house. A lot of people live like that. Don't live like that. There's a story in L.A. This uh, Korean couple bought a really nice house. A really large house with a wonderful, wonderful pool in the back. Right? And they were working really, really hard. You know, early in the morning, they go to work. Late at night, they come back because this is a really expensive house to pay for. And then the, uh, they hire a nanny, and, and, and this lady comes in, right? She, she's a, a, a Mexican descent, and she comes there. She cleans the house, takes care of the kids. She takes the pool, swims a little bit. Who do you think owns that house? Not the owners. You know what they're doing? They're working so that this lady can come and swim in their swimming pool. All right? She's the one who's enjoying. Korean mom and dad, they're not swimming in there. Just, it just looks good, right? Right? And they'll have barbecue, call some church people over once in a while. That's it. And so many people live their lives like that. They try to save up, save up, save up. And because they save up so much, right, they don't have life to live. They made their life about saving. You know what the Bible says is really good in the kingdom of God? The Bible says that good, in the kingdom of God, what is a good life is that you're able to help people around you, right? Feed people around you. Help them, help them, help them. But our culture has made it so that we think it's a good life when we can have other people's stuff. Remember the story where the guy says, I have a storage here, and I'm going to make, my, my, make myself merry and happy for the rest of my life? That's the problem with the world. We hoard ourselves so much, what happens is that I can't use it. At a certain level, I can't use it. And I prevent you from using it. It just rots instead of sharing and giving. And I think what God has called us is to be confident enough to know that I'll take care of you as children of God and learn to give your life away so that Christ may be honored in your life. That only comes when we understand who we are in Christ Jesus. Let me end with this um, this children's book is one of my favorite. My mom didn't read it to me uh, because when I was a kid, she didn't read English. I found it as an adult, and um, I think there is truth in this story. 
that has heart of God in it, but also it has heart of how he wants us to live our lives in light of that. It's by a, a person named Robert Munch. It's called Love You Forever. Anybody know this book? All right. You do? All right. Did your mom and dad read it for you? Did, did, did your parents read it for you? Yeah, well, I'm going to read it for you like no one has ever read it for you. All right? It's called Love You Forever. A mother held her new baby and very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I love you forever. I like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. And I should have been a librarian, I tell you. The baby grew, he grew, and he grew, and he grew. He grew until he was two years old. And he ran all around the house. He pulled all the books off the shelves. He pulled all the food out of the refrigerator. He took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. But at nighttime, when the two-year-old was quiet, she, uh, she opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked over the side of his bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The little boy grew, he grew, he grew, and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old, and he never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath, and when grandma visited, he always said bad words. And sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. But at nighttime, when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked over the side of his bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him back and forth, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living my baby you'll be. The boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a teenager. He had strange friends. He wore strange clothes and he listened to strange music. Sometimes mother felt like she was in a zoo. But at nighttime when that teenager was asleep, the mother would open the door to his door, crawl across the floor, look over the side of his bed. If he was really asleep, she picked that great boy up and rocked him back and forth back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. That teenager grew, he grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was grown up man. He left home and got a house across the town. But sometimes on dark nights, the mother got into her car, drove across the town. If all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened his bedroom window, <laughs> crawled across the floor, looked over the side of the bed, and if that great man was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. And one day she called her son and said, you'd better come see me because I'm very old and sick. So here, so her son came to see her. When he came in the door, she tried to sing the song. She sang, I love you forever. I like you for always. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and sick. The son went to his mother. He picked her up and rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he sang to her, I love you forever. I like you for always. As long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. When the son came home that night, he stood for a long time at the top of the stairs then he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms and very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while he rocked her, he sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. 
I love this story because somewhere in this story is discipleship. Because we have been discipled by our God who rocked our world forever. And then he went to heaven to prepare a place for us. And he asks us to go out and rock the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and let them know how much they are loved by God. You can only love the world when you are able to uh, see the love of God in you. And my friends, as we close our devoted worshipers, there are no better worshipers than those who understand who they are in God and express that beauty into this world. And I pray the valley of grace that that will take place from the youngest to the oldest because the older you are showing these younger kids that they're so beautiful and precious before God. And they grow up and letting people know I am the way I am because God has created me this way. And some of you adults who have never heard God say I love you and you feel like you need to do another work, another job, another, another house, another bank account, maybe today is a good time to stop and say, that's not who I am. Now, if you can't, go ahead. I'm, I'll never stop you. But life is more than an extra bathroom in your house. Life is about living with God and expressing him first and foremost to your family and to those around you. Again, thank you for having me, and God bless you guys. If God ever calls me again to this church, I'll talk about Daniel, okay? But today, I think that's what God wanted me to share with you guys. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I see before me a table which you have instituted so that your people can remember the one who paid his life for our life. And God, as we are sharing and understanding what that means, not only for salvation, but the totality of who we are as we live our lives on this side of the world, Father, I pray for every single one of us, especially the children in this room, that they would understand they're fearfully and wonderfully made, created in the image of God, masterpiece, expression of his love, your love. And you, create, you thought of them out of pleasure and love before the foundation of the world. So, Father, we thank you for the reminder. And from this point on, where we live our lives with that reality and make your name great among people for our God is the one who created us and we love you and we honor you this morning in Jesus name we pray Amen. Um, thank you pastor Sam um, before we start this next song I just wanted to uh, spend a little time just reflecting on something that Pastor Sam was sharing yesterday about um, when our passion for God flickers um, and when we lose sight of his love for us. Um, and he, he advised us to remember what it was like when we first came to love and know God, when we, we saw his face for the first time and we um, felt his love just pouring out on us um, and how simple it was to love him. Um, and through our journey of just loving God, it's so easy to just get pulled by all the distractions of the world, um, the pressures of the people around us, and then we forget what it's like to just rest in his presence and receive his love and love him. And um, like he said, our doing has replaced loving. And I pray that instead of doing so much, we just be and we're just present with God here. Um, the lyrics of this song, it says, take me back to the garden, lead me back to the moment I heard your voice and lead me back to the moment I saw your face. It was so simple and it was easy. You're so easy to love. So let's just take a little time to re reflect on that. Um, when we first felt God's love and knew it in our hearts.
sing take me back to the garden take me back to the garden lead me back to the moment i heard your voice take me back to communion lead me back to the moment i saw your face and it was oh, so
didn't know I could have a friend like you. I didn't know I could have a friend like you. I didn't know I could have a friend like you. I didn't know I could have a friend like Friends, I want to invite you to the Lord's table, and you may be seated. The table is called the Eucharist table, a table of thanksgiving. It's a table of blessing, and it's a table for believers who have confessed their faith in the Lord Jesus. Let me pray for us as we invite God to be with us in the elements as we prepare our hearts to receive Christ's body that was broken for us, the blood that was shed for us. Father, we thank you that you have given us the communion table, a table that represents our oneness and union with Christ that you purchased in Calvary through your body that was pierced and torn and broken for us. You who by your stripes made us enemies come together in peace with you and with each other. And the blood that was shed that atoned for all of our sins, we honor your sacrifice. God, I pray that you bless this table, that as we eat the bread and the juice, Lord God, that it would not just be a symbol or representation, but God, I pray that your spirit will stir our hearts with new affections for your son, Jesus. That you form us more and more into the image and the likeness of Christ to spiritual maturity. Learn how to walk with you in discipleship. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it and said, take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, symbolizing the new covenant shed by his blood. And as he poured out, he gave his disciples and said, take and drink. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, we are remembering the death of our Lord Jesus until he returns. I'm going to invite our ushers to come up and they're going to pass the elements. And at our church, we'll take it together. So we'll take the bread and the juice together. Scripture says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of this bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So as you guys prepare to take the elements, I, I want you to just take a minute to just examine your body, examine your heart, your soul, the state of your, your, your heart. And can we just go into time of honest confession? Lord, this is what, this is, this is where I've been. God, I ask by the grace of the gospel 
that you'll clean me once again of all my sins, all my shortcomings. That once again, I could experience your blood and your body and your grace in you. Thank you that I can approach your throne of grace and confidence because what you have done, the price that you paid on the cross, that is faithful to forgive us for all of our sins. And he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. So take a minute for a time of confession and then we'll take the elements together. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. we stand together we're gonna confess the lord's prayer together and i'll pray the benediction over you our father who are in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who debt against us Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious Father, we thank you that you call us your own. You call us the beloved. Thank you for all that you have done this past two nights and three days. Thank you for the ministry of Pastor Sam Shin for his devotion, dedication to bless us through the word of God. I thank you for all the saints that have gathered here on the mountain that you've called us to be devoted worshipers, to be lovers of God. God, may, may we be reminded of the first and greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, heart, and strength. And the second is likewise, to love our neighbors as ourselves. It is because of what you have done on the cross, on Calvary, the price that you paid, that you lived the perfect life that we could never live. And you paid the price, the punishment, the death that we deserve. And because you rose again on the third day, and you're seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, your resurrection. Though we die, we live. We have the hope of new life and resurrection in Jesus. We thank you for the good news of the gospel. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.